Hey, 42 here. Being a young nerd can be a stressful life. You try to drown out the laughter in the library with the clatter of your keyboard. You polish your rare Yoda figurine. But as the years pass and awkwardness and acne turn into acumen and achievement, you start to realise that all the time spent coding isn't just putting you ahead of the cool kids, it's giving you access to the strings that control the way that modern life works whilst they slave away in their miserable 9 to 5s. But, as you well know from your annual Lord of the Rings convention, the Ring of Power can be a heavy burden to bear. One which some manage better than others. So today, we look at some of the great computer geniuses of our time, and see whether they use their impressive skills for good or for evil. So, pack up your 12-sided dice, put a hold on diving into that Python versus Java Reddit argument, and let's see what happens when nerds go wild. When you think of antivirus software, and I'm sure you do that all the time, you think of that little red shield of McAfee. The product still bears the founder's name, even though it is now owned by computer giant Intel. The creator, John McAfee, doesn't just break the mould of the traditional IT guy, he grinds up the mould, snorts a few lines of it, and then waves a gun in its face. <laughs> Born in 1945 on a US Air Force base in the UK, McAfee's family soon moved back to Virginia, where his father shot himself when McAfee was just 15. He started drinking heavily at a very young age, but he was a talented mathematician and he got a degree. He started a PhD but was kicked out for sleeping with a student. He jumped around different jobs for many years as they often clashed with his growing drug habit. He almost lost his mind to a psychedelic called DMT. After deciding the first line was doing nothing, he hoovered up the whole bag and ended up cowering by a dumpster from fear of the voices in his head. He even said that he's not completely sure that he's still not on that trip. But he cleaned up. And in 1986, he came across a famous brain virus made by two brothers in Pakistan as a test to see how far a virus could travel. This and his general sense of paranoia pushed him to set up his first antivirus company. He made millions through various business ventures, but was always looking for the new thing. So rather than retiring and giving his brain a much needed rest from the voices and streams of code, he bought up a ranch in Belize and tried to create an all-natural antibiotic. I mean, if he could cure computers, why not kill people too? Well, on that, he did have to leave Belize, after being accused of turning off his neighbour and not being able to turn him back on again. He allegedly tortured and murdered him as retaliation for the death of his dog, none of which has ever been proved. With a life this wild, the only logical thing was to run for president in 2016. But of course, the American people were never going to elect a crazy rich businessman who lived entirely in his own reality. Jonathan James was such a talented hacker that he wasn't even limited to this planet. He accessed the source code to the International Space Station, potentially giving him control of their life support systems. He was just 15 at the time of the hack, and at 16, his house in South Florida was raided by NASA, the Department of Defense, and the local police. He became the first juvenile to be incarcerated for cybercrime. He was initially under house arrest, but this turned into time in a federal facility when he broke his prohibition by using drugs. He stayed out of trouble until 2007 when police again raided his house, believing him to have been involved in a hack on TJX, a large chain of department stores. He denied being involved, but sadly he had lost all faith in the American justice system, and he shot himself in the shower in 2008, as he believed he would be prosecuted no matter what. Our next programmer is almost the mirror opposite of Jonathan James. Rather than evading the Department of Defense, she spent a long time trying to join it. As a naval officer during World War II, and rather than dying young, Grace Hopper went on to become one of the oldest commissioned officers on active duty, retiring just before her 80th birthday. She was one of the first people to show that you can program using English. Since many of her so-called superiors thought computers were only capable of doing arithmetic and had to be programmed via machine language and binary code. 
She created the first compiler, which is a program that takes source code written in English and converts it into object code that computers can actually use, like binary. As well as a computer pioneer, she was also a great teacher, and one of her famous props was a length of wire 11.8 inches long that she would had made to represent the furthest distance electricity could travel in a nanosecond, helping to illustrate why signals took time to reach satellites and why connections in a computer needed to be very, very small. She was such a navy legend that they even named a destroyer after her, USS Hopper. When Richard Stallman was just a boy in camp, he used to read the manual for the IBM 7094. I can only assume he also used its hefty weight to beat back the never-ending rush of girls who surrounded him. But back in the 60s, if you wanted to get your sticky little hands on an actual computer, you'd need a few million dollars and a couple of rooms to put it in. So it wasn't until his senior year in high school as part of his summer job at IBM that he actually got to finally enter the digital world, and it was love at first sight, or rather, var sight equals love. But in the late 70s and early 80s, he saw that the rise of cyber business and the free-for-all attitude towards software that he had enjoyed during his time at Harvard and MIT became much more commercial and guarded. Passwords started appearing everywhere, source codes were held onto and locked down tightly rather than published, copying was prohibited. He disagreed with all of this, not because he didn't think people should make money from software, but because not being able to edit it to fit what you needed seemed like a crazy way to limit everybody. All of this led him to set up GNU, a free software and collaboration project that led to, among other things, the operating system Linux which IT geeks around the world will install just so that they can look down on you smugly, and because its logo is a penguin. Stallman is a big supporter of heroic whistleblowers such as Assange and Snowden, and begins all of his emails with, quote unquote, to any NSA and FBI agents reading my email, please consider whether defending the US Constitution against all enemies, foreign or domestic, requires you to follow Snowden's example. Now I personally begin with hi, but each to their own. So just remember that when you're brushing away two days worth of Oreo crumbs so you can comment LMFAO hashtag fail on another video of a dog ice skating. Thanks for watching. If we go back to the Middle Ages or even all the way back to the Roman Empire, was life ever any better than it is right now? then you could be an extraordinarily intelligent person, possibly even genius level.